Uh, good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, this is a call to order for the Aspen City Council regular meeting for September 13th, 2022. Could we have a roll call for attendance, please? Here. And here as well. Uh, for the members of the public, uh, Ward Hallenstein will not be with us this evening. He is actually uh, visiting a sister city in Bariloche. <clears throat> he is our delegate for the 20th anniversary of our sister city relationship with Bariloche. So we have sent him down to South America to uh, give our best wishes and to uh, be with our sister city community. Um, we're going to start off with scheduled public appearances. Uh, tonight we've asked that Scott Miller will join us and give us a brief update on uh, the construction that's going on on the Castle Creek Bridge and some of the detour routing that is going on currently. So, Scott, if you would, thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I first want to point out that this is a project funded and managed by the Colorado Department of Transportation, or CDOT, as a structural improvement to the west expansion joint of the Castle Creek Bridge. That joint has failed repeatedly. Um, this bridge, which you may not know, is the busiest two-lane bridge in the state of Colorado. <clears throat> and it is reaching the end of its useful life. The day is rapidly approaching when Aspen citizens must make a decision about replacing this bridge. This project is about doing repair work one lane at a time. One can only imagine what it would be like to replace the entire bridge. And that's all I'll say today. The city of Aspen is doing everything we can to assist CDOT with this project. We have obvious interest in this project concluding as quickly and as safely as possible. City staff have assisted with detour route logistics, traffic control, communications, and ideas to improve the project. We ask that the traveling public and Aspen citizens collaborate with CDOT as well by staying on the detour route by being patient, by avoiding the area as much as possible, and by using al alternative forms of transportation, such as carpooling, the buses, biking, walking. Um, there has been much discussion in the community about the detour route. The current route was <coughs> chosen for its ability to move all vehicles into and out of town efficiently safely and as quickly as possible, to prioritize bus transit options and to keep those buses moving as quickly as possible, and then to allow for safe, quick movement of emergency vehicles through the corridor. Some in the community have asked, why not keep all vehicles on main through the S-curves, then separate the larger vehicles and the passenger vehicles sending the larger vehicles to the left or the west toward the bridge, and then the passenger vehicles to the north, and then down Power Plant Road. Um, we have looked at it, and CDOT and their engineers have looked at it. <clears throat> and there is one main reason why this doesn't work. The, the turning radius and the lane width in both of the S curves is insufficient to allow two lanes to turn through those, those S curves at the same time. Um, so to do so would just create a catastrophic bottleneck at those S curves. Traffic would be stopped more than it is moving. Um, uh, and I just want to conclude with saying that we and CDOT understand that this is difficult for many people, causing many citywide impacts. This is necessary work on a critical piece of transportation infrastructure, and we just hope we get through it safely and get it done as quickly as possible. 
Scott, could you also um, <clears throat> give us any updates that you know about timeline, not just on the Castle Creek Bridge part, but you know, what are we looking at for the next month and a half, I think it really is? CDOT estimated this repair to the bridge to be three weeks, I believe. She's, she's on her oh. way. <laughs> we'll ask the expert. <laughs> Phone a friend. The bridge work, work will continue until October 7th. During that time, at the same time, that's going to start next week, they're going to start milling uh, from the bridge to ABC. And so um, that milling and paving work will happen concurrently while they're working on the bridge. After they're finished with the bridge, that work will still continue um, through October. Uh, okay. Uh, and, and really, this is for public information. So we're talking about three weeks of the bridge work, current conditions. Even after that finishes, then we still have some more highway work that's going to be done. And for folks that are like, what are they doing and why? Um, you know, the, the best example is, uh, for example, at the Truscott Light, uh, the, the, the roads there are deeply rutted. Um, I assume that that's kind of uh, the condition that they're looking to fix. Um, I assume it, without fixing that during this off season, um, uh, winter driving conditions in that area could be very treacherous with ice buildup in some of those ruts. So, um, you know, this is work that has been scheduled for quite a while. There's no great time to do this, but because of our weather and because of the busy summer that we had, it's sandwiched into this time. Uh, any other comments that you might have? This is a significant investment um, in our infrastructure. It's in excess of $11 million that uh, the state is spending on this stretch of highway. So it's, it's much needed, um, you know, work. And we're, we're happy that they're, you know, spending this kind of, you know, funds that are, that, you know, that are needed on this kind of infrastructure. Uh, and then the only thing I'll add, and I think other council members might have questions or comments, but, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest thing that we can do is ask for people to, to adhere to the detours that we are setting up. Um, truly, that CDOT, it, is setting. That, that CDOT, well, it, it, it's a joint effort that yeah. we're doing. And, 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 you know, when we talk about people that are cutting through the West End, some of those routes and some of that, that traffic is actually slowing down the overall flow of traffic. So the best thing that we can do is ask for people to participate by staying on the detour routes that are, that are designated. Uh, council members, other questions or comments right now? Just a little more clarification. So the, uh, on the timeline, so the bridge till October 7th, the work on 82 between the ABC and the bridge <clears throat> through the end of October, but then we also have work between the Hotel Aspen Project and the Pepke Transit Center on Main Street. How does that interact with that timeline? Hotel Aspen will continue on. Um, that, you know, that project is, um, you know, on its own timeline as far as, you know, the, the hotel itself. Sure, um, but the point, the, the, the stage that will impact transportation on Main Street. So the, the part that's right in front of, um, well, actually in front of the Molly Gibson, that yeah. part, um, so that's not necessarily Hotel Aspen. Yeah, sorry. Uh, that, that section of, of, of sidewalk that's dr directly in front of the hotel, that will not be completed until the spring. But all the rest of the infrastructure associated with the Pepke uh, Transit Hub will be completed this fall. Um, the 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 closure the lane closures that that are occurring right now on main street that that should open up or there's they're on, they're on track to open that up tomorrow afternoon <laughs> um the next part of that project will include um closing down south garmish street and for paving so they'll they'll start the paving work on garmish itself um the if, if you were out there recently you could see that the structure is starting to go up um, so it's starting to take shape and um, end of fall being end of October, November. Yeah, exactly. And that one of those. Yeah. We'll say end of November sure. to be safe. Yes. Great. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Could have my birthday and the new thing. Bridget. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to thank you, Scott, for the update, as it were, and uh, really emphasizing that this is a CDOT project as much as we're trying to assist them with their traffic uh, management issues on this. Um, it was many years ago, I, so I don't know the, the current stats, but uh, when you mentioned that this bridge sees more traffic than any other two-lane bridge in Colorado, uh, I recall um, our traffic engineers saying at, at the time it was receiving more traffic than the Eisenhower Tunnel. And so, uh, you know, as we were doing the record of decision. So we've spent a tremendous amounts in Aspen to try to keep those traffic levels low and similar to the 1993 levels. But I think that what we're seeing now is um, obviously that we are a real town and uh, we don't have fairy dust to make it all go away at night. Uh, a lot of the batch plants that uh, produce asphalt don't operate at night. And, you know, you're up against the deadline of when those uh, asphalt plants close entirely for the winter season. And that gets to where the stuff would just harden in the back of the truck before they can put it on the road. So, uh, you know, we're really racing against time. I would say that uh, from the county side, when we used to always get an update from our regional director, I would ask, when is the repaving of Highway 82 out through the airport going to happen? And they would tell us it was on year five of the five-year plan. That went on for 10 years. And so we're finally seeing some of that pavement happen because it has got some dangerous potholes out there and it's really falling apart. I don't know what would happen with another winter. So um, about a year and a half ago, or maybe one of the last times I was there uh, complaining and asking, they put this little teeny spit of asphalt in just from the roundabout to the road. And, and, and you could tell because they hadn't covered the old white markings, you know, the lane dividers. But that, that was the only little patch job we got out of them. And th this is just real life in real world. Um, this summer, I was traveling through Montrose for a Club 20 meeting. And this is July, their peak travel season, peak summer tourism. And their entire Main Street had been milled. And their entire Main Street for probably about 10 miles was was orange cones and barrels. And so literally everyone has to suffer through this at times if you want to keep your infrastructure up. So um, I do, as Turi has and others, urge patients, urge you to follow the rules. There's no faster way for anybody else. And it gets dangerous. There's families and children in the West End. So people need to really pay attention to where they are and their surroundings and acknowledge that this is just a real, a real world situation. We're actually fortunate CDOT is taking care of us this year. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, I'd just like to add that um, it seems obvious we need to think about another bridge <clears throat> and work on the entrance to Aspen because uh, this is, it's just going to continue like this except worse with more visitors and more growth. And more repairs. And more repairs. Keeping it held together. We will experience this again and again in future years until we have a modern bridge. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Trish. Oh, that'll bring us to citizens' comments and petitions this evening. Um, <coughs> look online to start. And I've got a hand up for um, Mr. Faruqi. Can you hear us? If you can un yep, and go ahead and unmute. Thank you. Okay. Yes, please introduce yourself for the record. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Tarek Faruqi, and uh, I thank you for the opportunity to make this statement. Can you hear me? Yes, we've got you. Okay. This summer on July 15th, a significant volume of water, mud, and debris flooded our home located at 125 South Garmer Street in Aspen. The flooding left four to six inches of water covering the entire lower level of our house that afternoon. On that day and at the time of the flood, construction, excavation, and utilities work related to the city's Pepke Transit Hub Improvement Project was ongoing near the intersection of West Hopkins and South Garmish. Prior to the flooding, the contractor for the city's Pepke Transit Hub project deposited huge mounds of soil and other materials 
directly in front of our property and impaired the stormwater drains. As anyone who was in town in July this summer knows, the entire stretch of street and sidewalk in front of our home on South Garmish between Main Street and Hopkins was torn apart as part of the Pepke project. As a result, during the afternoon thunderstorm on July 15th, the construction materials and activity which had damaged or blocked the storm sewers and obstructed South Garmish redirected the water runoff toward our home in an unnatural way, causing an unprecedented and devastating volume of storm water to overwhelm the door leading to our home's lower level and flood into our residence. The water forced into our home by the city's project caused significant damage and personal trauma. My two young nephews, ages nine, seven and nine, were in our home's lower level at the time when the water started flowing inside and the flooding terrified them. My parents and brother rushed helpless downstairs to try to fight the incoming water while simultaneously trying to calm the crying children. The aftermath of that afternoon includes a growing list of issues and property damage that we've suffered. The flooding knocked out our home's boiler, leaving us without hot water. We incurred approximately $45,000 in mitigation costs alone as a local company that we contacted came in on July 15th and for weeks afterwards ripped up the floors, carpeting and walls of our home to try to prevent mold, bacteria and other contamination and damage. Given the lack of hot water that continues to this day and the loss of half of our home's bedrooms, we have not been able to live in our home and had to leave. Estimates to replace and repair the lost and damaged property total in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. The city council and the entire community need to be aware of what happened to my family and our property and what challenges we continue to face because of the flooding caused by the city's project. In direct conversations and meetings before the transit hub project started work right outside our home's front gate, city staff and the city's contractor assured us that all necessary precautions would be taken to safeguard our home and everyone residing in it. Instead, we've been disregarded and we suffered and are continuing to suffer inconceivable damage because of the project. After the flooding occurred, city staff continued to reassure my family and me that they would remedy everything. Although everyone, including members of city staff, knows that the project caused the flooding, my family have been given the runaround with continued delays, deferrals, and denials. Instead of doing the right thing and paying for the damage caused by the city's project, city staff have decided to listen to the misguided recommendation of the city's insurance company and deny payment for our costs because the city has an indemnification clause in its contract with Gould Construction. But the Pepke Transit Hub project is the city's project. The city chose this contractor, awarded the contractor the business, and signed a contract with this contractor. My family had nothing to do with any of that, and it is clearly wrong for us to be inserted into the predictable finger-pointing and blame-casting between the city and its contractor that is sure to come. We should not have to bear the burden of chasing down reimbursement and compensation for the damage done by this project on top of all the difficulties of managing the work necessary to make our home usable and livable again. The members of the city council have often emphasized the importance of ethical behavior and accountability. And yet to, the day, to this date, the city has, has shirked this responsibility to us as members of its community. I asked the, the council members, how would you feel if your home was damaged because of a neighbor's project, you and your family were forced to leave it, and then the neighbor refused to own up to the damage their project caused? We respectfully request the city council to demonstrate the leadership that is necessary in a situation like this. Instead of continuing to hedge and to hesitate in ways that deepen and extend the harm the project has already caused us, the city and city staff should do the right thing promptly and with conviction and remedy our continuing damages. Thanks again for the opportunity to make the comment. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. We will look into it. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. David Howe. Yes, I'm on the phone. Can you hear me? Yes, we've got you. Please introduce yourself for the record. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm David Heil, a volunteer board member and acting president for the Aspen Science Center. I was just notified of the opportunity to speak with this group uh, a short while ago, and I'm still in the traffic uh, outside the bridge, so I appreciate being able to do this by phone. Um, I'm calling in because I wanted to uh, touch base on the Armory Project. Uh, I was... Uh, privilege to participate in earlier public input steps for that project, the survey document, as well as 
the focus group uh, input that was held and had the chance to uh, uh, contribute to those discussions regarding community input and engagement uh, eventually with that building and its uses. I read recently that uh, there was this uh, project was discussed at a recent council meeting and wanted to touch base with your group in regards to our interest in helping get this off the ground, even if it's in an interim or pilot phase. We're very, very much interested in contributing to a collaborative community-based approach to this uh, facility and we're happy to work with ACRA which was a likely uh, tenant in that building and even other tenants that are currently being considered to try to pilot and uh, begin animating that space with public engagement in mind and I just wanted to be sure that you had that on record and that you knew who I was and, and who we were as an organization. Um, one of your counselors obviously has a pretty good insight into our uh, programming. Uh, Skippy worked with the Science Center for a number of years before uh, joining the council and helped operate a pop-up facility at Crystal Palace that we had for about a three-month window uh, and uh, was very successful at drawing public engagement and school engagement during that time. So we can start with something like that on a smaller scale obviously but we can also be very creative and work with the uh, city staff and these other potential tenants and partners in the project to come up with some programming that reflects the group that's there, but also the interests that have been shared in that public input phase. So really, it's, it's just a, a brief opportunity for me to let you know that we're still very interested in the conversion of that building to public use uh, and engagement, and that we as an organization would like to collaborate with other organizations to help make that happen. Even in the interim uh, phase, we're Plenty of planning and, and budgeting is still ahead, but to, to let the community know that uh, the city is moving forward and something exciting is going to be coming coming forward with that facility. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, David. It's awesome. Thank, thank you very much for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, David. Are you uh, available this Thursday? I could be. Yes. What's Thursday? Thursday would be an opportunity for you and I to talk and we can go over the meeting that we had yesterday and see if there's opportunity for your involvement in this interim uh, phase that we're in. How about uh, early afternoon on Thursday? Sounds good. Will that work? Yes. I'll, I'll be in touch and we'll try to set you up. I presume I'll just meet you there at City Hall? That'd be great. Or we can even do it on telephone, whatever's best. Traffic, no, I hear you. Traffic can be I, difficult be in, these days. Yeah, I know. I'll be in Snowmass that morning uh, working on a project with them, so I can just come down and uh, meet you probably by, let's say, 1.30 or so. Sounds good. Let's touch base before that. All right. Well, again, thanks to the full council, and I look forward to uh, additional conversations. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so if council's all right with that, I'll just engage with him to talk about what we discussed last night about interim uses, et cetera. Okay. Um, looking for more citizen comments, petitions this evening, and I'm going to go in room now. That is the uh, Zoom attendees in room, members of the public that wish to comment this evening. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council table, and that'll bring us down to council member and mayor's comments. Council members, John, can I start with you? Um, sure. <laughs> We all know about how dry the Colorado River Basin is, but uh, recently I learned that the Rio Grande Basin is so dry that there's no water running through Big Bend National Park right now. You can walk on dry stream beds. And that is also because the mountains in northern Mexico aren't getting the water they're used to getting, which is obviously uh, impacting Monterey, Mexico, which is rationing water for a city of, I believe it was five million people. Anyway. Um, that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Good news, Journal. Uh, let me follow you up with Chapter 2. Um, uh, thank you. I, I had uh, been on the road a little bit last week with a couple of events that uh, coincided. Uh, somewhat out of the blue, I got invited to uh, participate in a Women Waters Leaders Tour of the Colorado River. Uh, we started up in Grand County at their Headwaters Center had a great uh, panel discussion and went on to uh, one of the ranches on the Yampa uh, where they are working desperately to try to save the river and the trout fisheries there despite low water. Uh, down to Glenwood Springs and a quick short float on the river 
before heading to Mesa University <laughs> in Grand Junction. It was quite a full day um, to talk with the college president there and have dinner with that group. We uh, proceeded the next day to see some of the orchards and how they're managing water shortages. And the uh, final part that I was able to participate in was to visit the roller dam right above the 15 mile reach. Uh, why this was uh, put together by XL Energy and some of the other Denver people, I think I and a few others um, were some of the only West Slope participants uh, overall, What was to try to educate some of the front range uh, influencers about how dire the situation is and how well the water is used on the West Slope. Um, and I think it was very eye-opening to a lot of people. I, the mayor of Lone Pine was there, mayor and some real estate agents, a lot of different people. Um, it was their first attempt at an engagement tour, and I think they're hoping to do more, potentially the San Luis Valley uh, in May. But what I wanted to emphasize out of it was we got a really great presentation while we were there at the roller dam showing the four different um, diversions that occur right above the 15-mile reach and the work they've done to try to reduce the take. They've been able to combine all four of those former diversions into one outtake in the river so they can take less. Um, they have a fish ladder that's installed to try to maintain the um, endangered fish, and that's going to lead into just a slightly more complicated comment. Um, the 15 mile reach is the part of the river that has been so dewatered before it hits the uh, Gunnison uh, coming in um, that, uh, that that's why we have an endangered fish prog program in Colorado. And um, it's the four different major fish uh, people have heard of them before, the pike minnow and the bony chub and things like that. But because we've had a successful endangered fish program, when anyone wants to pull water or a new water right from the Colorado, they're covered. They don't have to go to the feds and explain how their take, whether it's one acre foot of water or three cubic feet per second or whatever, won't further endanger the endangered fish. And Colorado's been funding this program for quite a while, as well as uh, a great many others. We all know that there's fish water in Rudai Reservoir that has been placed there um, as, as part of this solution. But the programmatic biologic opinion calls for there to be 800, uh, 800 cubic feet per second uh, flowing through the 15 mile reach. And they haven't been able to maintain much above 500 uh, cubic feet per second most of the summer. And that means the fish ladder doesn't work. There's not enough uh, uh, water in the flow to be able to sort the fish out. And uh, there are about, I guess, eight or 10 native fish to Colorado, and yet there's 50 invasive fish that are in this whole section uh, eating the, the food, eating the fry, the young. And so it's a, it's a real battle. Um, the additional issues that we're really facing here is that the um, endangered fish program is funded with revenues from the Lake Powell and the hydro, hydro generation. And hydro generation is down 35% this year uh, of its normal capacity because of the low flows. There's not enough head in the body of water to really push the turbines. And that is what that big push is uh, from the federal government. I keep talking about saving the Colorado, but it's really about saving Lake Powell and the power generation at Lake Powell. So um, it was very interesting to talk with the operators of these old diversions at the roller dam, you see it when you're on your way to Grand Junction. Um, and and th these are salt of the earth people who've really been trying to maintain their agribusiness and their water supplies. And, and um, to hear them talk about how, you know, we would never sit in the same room with some of these people 10, 12 years ago. Now we have to, yeah. and it's the only way we're all going to cooperate and solve these problems uh, or hope to solve them. And also the comment was very clear that we're not um, the type of people who panic. Uh, we just work through things. But I'll tell you, we were as close to a panic as possible this July. And if the heavy monsoons hadn't been quite so moist, we're not sure what we would have done. 
And so that comes to the delivery of water for the Grand Valley, for the city of um, Grand Junction, for the orchards. But when they don't have enough water for the programmatic biologic, the calls come on the compact, prior appropriation system comes into effect, and communities are just literally cut off from their water take. Um, I've heard that before from some of the ranchers in the Crystal River Valley, that it may seem good to us because there's a little more water coming down the Roaring Fork. They've had to turn off the Twin Lakes diversion, but it also means that the agriculturalists in the, in the Crystal Valley and, and others in our valley um, lose their water rights. So I just wanted to kind of give this report back to let people know how very, very precarious our overall water situation is, and especially those who have uh, junior rights and aren't really um, very far down on, on that line. So um, I hope to continue following these issues. I know uh, from talking with our uh, utility manager, Tyler, we're planning on sending comments uh, as well as many others to the state's new draft of the water plan. They're updating their water plan uh, that was passed a number of years ago. And the real concerns are, of course, that the West Slope will become the sacrifice zone. Um, there has been federal money secured to help pay on a voluntary basis farmers to fallow their fields and, and not grow. Um, but it's a little bit of a short-term solution. You, you can't fallow peach trees. You can't fallow vineyards. You can't fallow cherry trees or apricot trees. So all the stone fruit areas are, are a little worried about this. Um, there's also starting to be a lot of outside Wall Street investors buying the ranches and the farms and the alfalfa fields in Grand Junction. And that keeps an awful lot of our water flowing westward instead of eastward. Uh, the folks uh, with Excel who help sponsor this um, is something we should all give a little credit to for keeping the uh, power plant in the middle of Glenwood Canyon running. Um, that's a very, very small percentage of their renewable portfolio any now, anymore. It's a very, very old turbine system. Um, but it's the major water right that keeps about uh, 1,200 cubic feet per second flowing towards Grand Junction and towards the endangered fish. Um, they could sell that water right to the Front Range. Mm. And uh, one of their major uh, customers uh, uh, of a large utility is actually Denver and the Front Range. Mm. So um, all of the water that we have is, is somewhat precariously uh, placed as much as, as much as the Rio Grande Basin. So again, back to the comments on the water plan, if uh, any other citizens care to write in, um, it doesn't have to come from an agency. But the concern is that while we're cutting back um, hundreds of acre feet, maybe thousands of acre feet of water used for agricultural purpose on the, on the West Slope, there's not really going to be any decrease of the takes from the Front Range diversions. And so it doesn't really add water into the system in, in the classic sense. There is um, significant return flows from the ag water. So um, we're, we're in the bullseye, um, as they say, stretched from either side of the rubber band, going water that way and water that way. So everyone needs to really pay attention to those issues. Um, the second thing I would cover from the, the trip I was on was uh, the Club 20 meeting in Grand Junction. It was their annual, uh, biannual uh, fall meeting. Uh, it had a, a really productive uh, business meeting with Club 20. We've passed um, updated transportation guiding principles and updated uh, agricultural guiding principles, which were taking multiple older resolution and position papers and combining them into one more readable and more generally applicable. But the real activity uh, of this fall was, of course, the campaign debates that were held on Saturday uh, in conjunction with Colorado Mesa University and the Daily Sentinel. So it was really nice to be able to see our candidates who may be representing us uh, able to discuss the issues that are facing us, water and particularly the future of ag. Um, so we heard from uh, this, our, our Senate District uh, 5. We heard from our House District 57. We heard from the candidates for state treasurer. We heard from both candidates for attorney general. And of course, the main event was the big uh, congressional District 3 between Adam Frisch 
and Lorena, Congresswoman Lorena Boebert. So um, I think it was a, a really good uh, event for public viewing, for public participation, and for a value to democracy, to uh, not be able to hide behind um, screened calls on a tele town hall meeting, um, to really be able to um, face the public in a in a real life forum. And I appreciate uh, both of those entities, uh, Mesa University and the Daily Sentinel for assisting with that and the Club 20. So I want to thank you all and give you that report. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, do me a favor, next Club 20 meeting, please pass my thanks to Club 20. I will. In, in putting on that candidate debate, I found it um, fascinating entertaining and informative. Thank you, I, I will pass that along. Yeah, please do. <laughs> uh, other council comments, Skippy? Sure, I'll uh, <laughs> start with the yin to the yang. Rachel, I, I really appreciate all that stuff and uh, through those challenges, I hear a number of silver linings in there and you know, <coughs> the, the beginning of the emergence of some solutions based on some really challenging things, like just that cross-pollination of groups that would never have met before to solve problems practically is, it's a start, it's not nothing. Um, so on that, on that end, uh, I, I, I had a, a, a different retreat uh, over the last couple of weeks. I got to go to one of my favorite places in the world, Black Rock City for uh, Burning Man. And no matter where I travel, I'm always thinking about us and governance and how we function in society. And so I had a couple of really interesting experiences that I learned a lot from. Uh, I got to tour uh, the, the entire city effectively with the uh, chief of staff and the head of government relations and learn about how you build a city from literally nothing to 80,000 people in a week. <laughs> how you run sewer and septic when there are no lines in the ground. Uh, how you deal with traffic when you have close to 60,000 cars coming into a one lane 90 degree turn. Uh, so it was, it was really interesting. Uh, it, was, it was really quite interesting. And, and giving some thought too, because it's a community that is run, that is governed on 10 core principles. Those principles are very tightly, not regulated, but enforced by the organization. But thereafter, the community is really left to create, and they're really given the freedom to carry out those principles as they see fit. And, um, and you know, kind of what I observed on the ground uh, is just how much of an impact that has on people, especially after COVID, when they get to truly feel and have agency in how they live and create their environment and what happens when you weave art and creativity through every aspect of a community. It was really, really beautiful to see. So I'm thinking a lot about that. Uh, I also had the opportunity with, with Jamie, my partner, uh, to train, took about 12 hours of training for Zendo. Uh, Zendo is the harm reduction arm of MAPS, which is the group that since 1984 has been pushing forward through the FDA prod, uh, process, uh, MDMA therapy for PTSD um, and other use of psychedelic therapies for uh, mental health conditions. Um, Zendo is now over a decade, it actually started at Burning Man, but it's a methodology they've created to sit with people having challenging psychedelic experiences. And uh, they're now training the Denver police, for instance, but we got trained in that and we sat as sitters. And uh, interestingly, of all the people we sat with, both of us on all our shifts, uh, everyone was sober, they were just having challenging experiences. And it was so different than I think what I've been trained to do in the modern world, which is solve, fix. You're literally there just to hold space, make somebody feel comfortable, recognize that they have everything they need to solve their own issue, and what you're doing is just giving them the ability to do so. And it was a really, really powerful experience and a, and a shift for me uh, about how to maybe empower versus some of my own inclinations towards control or solving or fixing. And so I'm gonna be meditating on that for a while from a leadership perspective. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Gibby. It'd be interesting if you could put some of that into uh, you know, a document, uh, especially some of the city infrastructure things that yeah. you experienced or yeah. learned about. It'd be interesting if you could share some of those um, things that you talk about there, traffic, transit, infrastructure, waste management. Um, and the lessons learned there would be fascinating. Cool, definitely. 
Uh, my comments this evening, I want to talk uh, real briefly about the Mayor's Cup Golf Tournament that is coming up this Friday. Uh, there are still a few available slots for those that are interested in playing in the golf tournament. It is a charitable event. It is benefiting two mental health resources in our community. That's Aspen Strong and the Hope Center. Um, you know, once again, as, as we like to remind people that it is okay to seek help. If you or somebody you know is struggling or needs somebody to talk to, uh, the Hope Center is a wonderful avenue, 970-925-5858. They are uh, experts at some of those crisis interventions, but also just giving uh, uh, some guidance for somebody to talk to. Uh, for AspenStrong.org, that is an excellent resource for some extended uh, opportunities for um, uh, whether it's somebody to talk to or even more uh, counseling. Uh, and truly, a lot of those are on scholarship programs, so they are free to the public as well. If you or anybody you know is uh, seeking help, then please utilize those two resources. I do want to say a, a big thanks to uh, All Tech and the Sticelinger Foundation, members of our community here in Aspen that uh, stepped up to kind of title sponsor, if you will, but uh, more than anything, just donate heavily to these two groups great resources in our community. Again, uh, there are still a couple of spots available. Uh, the other thing uh, that I wanted to bring up during my comments this evening is there is an idea about a commercial vacancy tax. Uh, a lot of us have talked for a number of years about some of the impacts to downtown commercial uh, redevelopment. We have a number of properties that can uh, lie uh, dormant, uh, unoccupied, and unutilized during construction phases for quite some time. Uh, and there is an opportunity for a commercial vacancy tax. The idea here is to incentivize those owners into uh, completing their construction projects, getting tenancy back into their buildings. Uh, I just am now learning about some places that are instituting this, um, and I'm looking to my other council members just to see if there's interest in getting more information about this. Um, it would require really Jim True and his staff to kind of look into what the, the programs there and the opportunities are available. But I'm just wondering if that is something that this council is interested in. Absolutely. I'd like to take a look at it, but I feel like our plate's a little full right now, so maybe put it on for the beginning of the year. Yeah, absolutely. Right now, it'd just be information gathering, and, and more than anything, just with any support, it'd be just a nod to Jim to, yeah, go ahead and spend a little bit of time kind of gathering some of that information. Uh, it's a it's a thing that I'm, I'm certainly interested in. It's a thing that, if you'd asked me five years ago, I probably was more bullish on because we had so many empty storefronts and you're talking about a different thing. You're talking about incomplete construction, right? Not so, or both, both. potentially, yep. both. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, in the last couple of years, what we've seen is those empty storefronts have kind of waned. Maybe we do or don't like what goes in there, but it just seems to be an issue that's semi-resolved itself. Um, but the ongoing construction is something I'd like to have a solution for, whether it's this or another solution is irrelevant. Um, not irrelevant. It's. It's not plus. I mean, we should find a solution. So open to looking at it. Uh, and I also just want to draw attention to, you know, we've also talked about uh, residential vacancy. And I think that's really the bigger issue. 68% of our, you know, homes are vacant most of the time. And we have a massive housing shortage. Uh, so I think we should be looking at these things uh, holistically and in concert. And I believe Van Vancouver has a very successful very residential successful. vacancy tax. Yeah, so I'd like to look at both. Well, and you have a number of businesses that have been closed, but no construction has yet begun. Yeah. For years. Yeah. There is that. Yep. I had an opportunity to talk to Philip about it earlier today, and, and we're happy to look into that further. I do believe that it would Im implicate his office also, as well as Wayne. I believe that's the case. <laughs> implicate. What would you like to call it? A fun involve. place? It might involve. Involve. <laughs> Implicates. Uh, implicates the word we want to change, not office. Got it. Well, thank you. Again, you know, uh, I take Rachel's comments to heart here, especially with ComDev. Uh, plates are full. Um, it's um, time for second helpings. Uh, but maybe, you know, there's no rush on this. We just would like to start gathering some of the information. Yeah. Jim, do you mind if I ask a clarifying question? Up to you. 
<laughs> yeah, go right ahead. My question. So yeah. I heard um, a discussion among, between, I think, Councilmember Mesero and Doyle about the residential side of things. And I, I, I just wanted to clarify if, 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 if we're going to engage in a research project, that we're engaging in the right research project. So I just want to maybe get direction on residential versus commercial or both. Both. At this time, I'm only requesting the commercial. I, I'm with Tori on that. I, I think one thing at a time. Understood. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. We've started that. We've started that. I just want to make sure we didn't just end that because I think that's a far more uh, important, not important, I shouldn't say it that way. I think not. that would yield more fruit for our community quicker. It, it's a different issue and I appreciate that, um, but just uh, the request right now is just the commercial to start That's with. fine. Which okay. is so we all heard. That other one was in the works. It's still in the works. It's in consideration for more information. Thank you, guys. Uh, those are my comments this evening. I. Yep. I forgot one thing. If Go right ahead. Um, I just want to let the public know that there is a very important uh, meeting on water, if you are available or interested, that's going to be this Friday, September 16th, in Grand Junction again. It's the Colorado River District's uh, annual presentation uh, on the state of the river and what's going on. It will be held at Colorado Mesa University in Grand Junction and beginning at 8.30 a.m. It's an all-day thing, again, on Friday the 16th. You can and register at their website uh, online. But um, it's really uh, nice to note, I, I had uh, uh, some associates who had attended the three-day water conference with Water Congress up in Steamboat Springs. And what they've told me is that this one-day conference has cherry-picked all the very best and most important speakers to be there in Grand Junction. Mm -hmm. So um, as I think everyone knows, we all pay property tax to the Colorado River District to help protect our water interest, and uh, this is the best place to go learn what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Looking for agenda amendments this evening? I didn't see any. Uh, city manager's comments? None, thank you. And board reports? Board reports are an opportunity just to update the community on some of the boards that we've uh, attended meetings for. I feel I essentially did that with the Club 20 debrief. Thank you. Thank you. Tom? I just have a little something from Nordic Council. Uh, we are moving forward with both a small snowmaking system at the golf course and on the benches above and behind the high school. Nice. Um, uh, John's already done Nordic, so APCHA meeting. Um, some brief updates on the communication uh, efforts. Uh, a newsletter open rate of 52%. I don't know of any other one that high. People are interested, people are opening, they are getting out there, we're growing our social media, uh, and we've got more in-person events upcoming. Ben Anderson came in uh, and kind of just gave the full rundown on the moratorium to the group, which spurred, uh, spurred a lot of conversation on sort of the next steps around how we get more affordable housing, and the APSHA board is very interested in what role can they play from a policy standpoint to um, help support our next steps around you know new housing development credits program improvements etc um, and so they're looking for uh, some support from our staff of here are the five or ten or 20 things you could consider that would help this process for us to begin working on, which was pretty cool. Um, and then the AMI discussion, uh, we also approved the 2022-2023 work plan. Uh, you can, I can share that with you guys if you would like. Uh, you, I think you saw the draft, well, it didn't change. And the uh, AMI discussion, so we had briefly considered switching to the snow mass model of, it's a non-category model where it's basically a range of things staff actually supported that which was kind of a surprise to us but we just decided it's too complicated it would require a huge amount of work and we're not quite sure what we're getting for it um, and so we are going to keep going as is with the the uh, one year increase to allowable income to adjust for inflation and all that and then uh, revisit for next year thinking of maybe moving the AMI but keeping our category system a little bit that makes sense 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then um, Burlingame Housing Board. Uh, it was really, really great. I had to leave early for our, our work session yesterday, but uh, it was great. It was the first full meeting we've had uh, sort of since the summer season, since the management handover, just really getting to understand the complexities of uh, a new management team coming in and kind of being faced with a lot of legacy sort of off the books agreements that had been made one off here and there between employers, individuals, and, and you know, trying to play catch up on what that stuff is, what to honor, what not to, and we got into some really fruitful discussions that weren't for policy decisions now, but what should the policy be? Should we continue to work with employers? Should we not? Should it only be the one in SKIKO that helped fund the project? Um, it's a MAA City of Aspen partnership. Okay, uh, then then maybe I misunderstood what Jackie was saying at the meeting, um, but uh, uh, Rafta obviously has been involved as well for some time, and so um, I think it's a it's a it's a fruitful conversation about what is and isn't appropriate based on what the needs were of the time, and that is forthcoming. And I would imagine you guys will want to have some good input on that because it has a lot of implications going forward for how we do things. Yeah. yeah. Up one more time. Um, this, this is something I'd been thinking about, and I should have brought it forward sooner. But um, there aren't often available sales units on the APSHA website or rentals, but sometimes there are. And I was thinking it would be valuable in our work sessions, perhaps, or our, our public meeting, to, to mention those when they're available the same way that Cindy Christensen does at the beginning of our APSHA meetings. And I encourage folks to go and sign up to the home track system so they can get notifications of uh, new units that come on online. There is an Annie Mitchell Homestead, which is at the Airport Business Center condominium. It's a category two, one bedroom, one bath, 675 square feet. And the current price is $148,213. There's also some rentals available, which are somewhat income cap because they are at the Aspen Country Inn, which is a senior and low income priority. Um, monthly rent is $958 a month for a one bedroom apartment there. And then there are a, is a two bedroom flat available at Truscott Phase Two. Uh, it is monthly rent of $1,095. You must complete a work history verification to be considered. Uh, again, these are more low income uh, units, so sometimes people's incomes are higher than they can qualify. There's also a two bedroom loft available at Truscott with a monthly rent of $1,310. Um, I, there's a two-bedroom, two-story apartment available at phase two of Truscott with a rent of 1,406. But these are all income capped. You have to look at the website and determine if you and your family might qualify. But I think it's um, valuable for us to promote when the units are available. That's great, and that, that reminds me of one more thing, sorry. Okay. Um, I, I didn't write down the number, so I take these as an approximate, but um, Jared was saying that in, as soon as the applications went live, and granted these are basically low category seasonal rentals of people who are not trying to move here hoping to get a job, but are already employed for their application, uh, 144 units available after you take out the raft of chunk and 500 applications. Mm -hmm. So, a big, big need. <laughs> Very much. Uh, board reports for me. Uh, last Thursday was RAFTA. Um, I will go into more. We have board reports uh, in depth uh, next week at our Monday meeting, uh, as well as uh, last Thursday was Picking County Public Health. Uh, on both of these, uh, primary uh, meeting item was the preparation of the budget for 2023 on both of these boards. And I'll tell you more about them next Monday. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I was remiss. I had one other comment during council comments, and this is just an acknowledgement to our city clerk's office. I want to say thank you um, for giving us live links on our agendas, um, not just for getting into our meeting, but also each item now is available uh, without just page numbers, but actually you can click on it and go right to the information that is on each item. I want to say thank you very much. Long time coming, and it's very helpful. Thank you. Gracias.
Uh, that brings us to our consent calendar this evening. Consent calendar is resolution number 58, a contract with Tyler Technologies uh, for a utility billing system. Resolution number 103, intelligent lighting fixtures for the Wheeler Opera House. Resolution number 105, purchase of switch gear to replace Puppy Smith substation. Resolution number 108, the Wheeler Opera House website redesign. Resolution number 109, the city attorney contract. Uh, item F is board and commission appointments, and G, the draft minutes of August 23rd, 2022. Are there any items that council members wish for further discussion or to pull for information? Only to thank our board applicants. Absolutely. Um, Rachel is uh, commenting on our board and commission appointments. Uh, we have about nine appointments in our uh, boards and commissions coming up on this. Uh, uh, consent calendar. We want to say thank you to all those that applied uh, and those that have been appointed. For those that did not receive the appointment that they might have been seeking, there are still board openings. We do encourage everybody to reapply. Um, keep your interest in uh, as uh, sometimes it's just whether it's a, a fit or a uh, amount of board seats or if there are others that are reapplying that have done a great job for the city at this point, um, there are still opportunities and we don't want to discourage anybody from participating. So please, if the, you did not get the appointment that you were seeking, uh, pay attention. We will be doing another round of interviews soon. With that, I'll take a motion for the consent calendar. So moved. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, could we have a roll call vote for the consent calendar, please? Councillor Doyle? Yes. Councillor Mazzaro? Yes. Councillor Richards? Yes. Mayor Tory? Yes. This evening, uh, we have no notice of call up or first reading of ordinances. That'll bring us to our public hearing. This is ordinance number 10, the Willoughby Pond Subdivision Water Service Agreement. We have had our first reading on this, and this is the public hearing. And if you'll just give us one moment while you're uh, getting prepared, Tyler, we appreciate right, that. I'll be back in a second. Okay. Mr. Mayor, is it all right if I proceed? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. Proceed. Oh, Good her shirt is Tyler your sign. Someone's sign. Utilities. Um, also joined tonight by. Uh, our applicants and members of the Buxbaum family, as well as uh, project representative Jim Curtis. Uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Mayor, we're in front of you tonight after our August 23rd first reading of ordinance number 10 for a public hearing. Uh, this ordinance contains an extraterritorial water service agreement for the Willoughby Pond subdivision. Uh, I'll briefly highlight a few important details of this agreement and the ordinance. Um. Two of the six lots of the subdivision are currently uh, receiving city water services and have so for almost 30 years. The subdivision is surrounded on all sides by lots served by city water and existing city water infrastructure is prevalent in the area. Uh, the applicants have requested a more formal agreement for water service from the city as they uh, intend to develop an additional lot in this subdivision. The applicant has agreed to a number of conditions that staff believes demonstrate a larger community benefit and allow staff to uh, ultimately support this request. These conditions include no net increase over existing ECU allocation uh, of system capacity ECU counts for the subdivision, uh, a payment of all uh, applicable city mitigation fees, including affordable housing, parks, uh, school lands and TDM. This can be found on page 165 of your packet. Uh, the development would also be responsible for construction of water mains and associated infrastructure to improve uh, Aspen's community water s system. Uh, this would include dedication of easements and all lots will uh, be required to comply with the water efficient landscape ordinance. Uh, and no outdoor water use of potable supplies would be permitted in the subdivision. Uh, additionally, water rights would be subordinated to the city's interests in Hunter Creek and in-stream flows during times of low flow. Um, as with the first reading, uh, we are here as staff to answer any questions council may have on ordinance number 10. Thanks, Tyler. 
I have no questions, but Thank you. public hearing. <coughs> Bless you, maybe. Seems pretty straightforward. Okay. Uh, this is a public hearing, so I'll go ahead and open the public comment portion for the public hearing. Are there any members of the public that wish to comment this evening on ordinance number 10, the Willoughby Pond Subdivision Water Service Agreement? Not seeing any online, any in the room? Not seeing any, bring it back to council table. I would make a motion to approve ordinance number 10, series of 2022, the Willoughby Ponds Subdivision Water Service Agreement. I will second that motion. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? We could take a roll call vote. This never happens like this. Councillor Doyle? Yes. Councillor Mazzaro? Yeah. Councillor Richards? Yes. Mayor Tory? Yes. Expedient. Delightful. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, that was so easy. Ooh, all right. Tyler, good work in preparing us and with all the details. We, you know, uh -huh. we really appreciate your thoroughness, and this is an item that it shows. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Did you put that on that time? If you wasn't lucky, are you sure? Would you tell me if you weren't? I heard that it fell down. Uh, I saw it Latest yesterday month. or two days ago, but it's white again. I think yeah, bleach I is real. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that'll bring us down to uh, action items this evening. We have resolution number 99. This is the short-term rental program guidelines. After uh, months, if not a year plus of work, we are back with uh, the guidelines. The whole Don't say it like program. that. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. There we go. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, for the record, this is Haley Hart, Long Range Planner. To my right, Philip Sapino, Community Development Director. Um, this is a presentation for Resolution 99 in support of the Short Term Rental Guidelines. And Mayor Tori, through your permission, I'd like to share my screen. Please do. Are you in the Zoom meeting? Just one minute while we get it going, thank you. It's doing the matrix thing, it's so fun. They bounce back and forth and they just go mutually into oblivion in the TVs. They do, they have everything, they have everything. <laughs> I will say I didn't, I didn't see a council table, so we got that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Our, uh, our city tour happened on a tank, so that, that was cool. <laughs> did, did you ride Fall. in it or on it? Uh, part of the time in it, part of the time on a platform over the tracks. Oh. Uh -huh. Hot inside? No. I mean, it was an art car tank, right? So it's actually like a bus that's turned into a tank. Uh, not an actual yeah. tank. Not an actual tank tank. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But this was a weapon of love. <laughs> Do you remember there were, used to it's be okay. some really old military Eventually vehicles? Eventually, it'll just give you warm parade. feels, and then you'll be yeah. like, oh, yeah. maybe. Joseph, will you make me a presenter, yeah. please? <laughs> I'm in the backyard or something. Absolutely. I remember those. Sorry, they just came out. <laughs> It's okay. I'm still like one foot in the dust. I'll come back here eventually. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so bringing it back to the short-term rental program guidelines, this is a tool that staff has created in um, work with design workshops um, as a consultant to illustrate our commitment to customer service as well as roll out the new program for the short-term rental regulations. And during the May 24th work session, so we can go to, sorry. Okay, great, all right. So during the May 24th work session, um, we had discussed how to bring the short-term rental regulations forward to the public. And part of that work session was to 
determined that we needed to create some sort of user-friendly guidelines. Um, so just as a reminder, this is Resolution 99 for the adoption of the short-term rental regulations um, that was placed forward in Ordinance 9, the adoption of the short-term rental regulations. <laughs> and um, we are hoping to get this through prior to the expiration of the moratorium for the issuance of short-term rental permits, um, which is set to expire at the end of the month. So October 1st is when the doors open for new regulations this document will support that rollout. So as part of that commitment, we included the section 26530-50D to ensure that adoption of the program guidelines was set forward. And the idea was to, you know, again, use this as a friendly sort of guideline tool um, for owners and operators to understand the new regulations. And this is just one of many of the tools that staff has developed to illustrate our commitment to customer service. We actually just received a print of the Good Neighbor Guide that we had created with Acra today. Um, we picked it up from the printer, that looks great. We've got other documents such as renewal forms, like a one-pager renewal form for current permit owners. We've got one-pagers for new owners. So we really are working on lots of different documents that will be able to be accessed on the short-term rental webpage. Um, but this one is going to be the most inclusive of those for owners and operators. So adoption of the guidelines is something that council has done in the past. Section 26208 outlines that city council can adopt any sort of guidelines that will be used as regulatory and guiding capacities by the city. Such examples are the historic preservation, preservation design guidelines and the engineering standards. So tonight we're just bringing forth a new set of these guidelines that are specific to short-term rentals. So these are the sections, the tables of contents within the program guidelines. The sections are intended to follow a permit process for any sort of permit T. So it could be for the short-term rental classic, the lodging exempt, owner occupied. The sections help identify what each permit type needs, what type of fees they are going to be paying, what the type of documents to support their application will need to be, and links to each of those documents. So the idea is just to create the workflow that one would be participating in when submitting for a new permit or renewing a permit. So one such example of the features within the guidelines are the flow charts that have been created to help users understand which type of permit they are. Um, I would say Emmy and myself have received most questions um, over the last few months about, you know, what permit are they, how can they qualify, what cap are they in. So the idea of this flow chart is to help owners and operators identify their permit type. And other sections are including the caps, what exactly is allowed, what is prohibited within the zones, um, and then additional information such as, you know, what is the new, newly defined qualified owner's representative. So really just creating a detailed explanation of new definitions, new terms, new permits. Another really great feature that is linked within the program guidelines is the new GIS page. So big props to the GIS team. They created this web page specifically for short-term rentals. It's linked to MuniRevs, so it's going to be continually updated as new permits come in and existing permits are renewed. So users can go type in their address, see who has a short-term rental in their neighborhood. They can click on their own address, see if they're in a capped zone, how many permits are available. So this is just one of the many tools that are within the program guidelines for users to use. Other updates, um, so on Thursday, uh, again, in, in addition to the, the guidelines, these sort of one-page documents, Emmy Garrigus is going to be holding a question and answer and presentation for 
anyone. It's basically, you know, just a one hour open house sort of outlining exactly what we've gone through, showing people how to, you know, click on the different links where they can find them within the website. Um, so this is just an open house um, for anyone to attend and understand what the short term rental regulations are. And then October 1st, again, that is when the moratorium will lift on the issuance of new permits and when we expect the first influx of new applicants to submit permits. Will that Thursday, the 15th event, be recorded in any way? It will, so and it will be placed on the web page. Cool. Yes. Another question, um, and if you'd like to answer it at the end, that would be fine, but We've all read about the challenges with the demolition permits coming in, being jammed on the computer by one agency. Um, are we prepared for uh, that sort of October 1st um, crush of people perhaps wanting to get in where uh, permits are capped and whether some may be available or not? Yes. Are you... You are. Yes. So Emmy actually has explicitly written out for the ComDev newsletter update, and it's going to go on the web page, that one email per applicant per address will be accepted. At that time, it will be time stamped and put into the queue. So there is a um, idea of how it will roll out and how timestamps will happen for the new applications. Um, and she is explicitly saying, you know, one email per address per application. Okay, and, and just one last question along that topic is, um, will renewing permits be the same time period as opposed to potentially people applying for a new permit, or will the renewing permits perhaps be on a day earlier or something like that? Renewals will be later. So renewals, so you have until the end, you know, December 31st of the year to renew your permit, um, and the renewals will be live on Unirevs either November and December. When uh, when we drafted Ordinance 9, we intentionally extended existing permits to December 31st of this year so that we didn't have renewals and the end of the permit moratorium happening on the same day. So, so we bought ourselves three months so that that October 1st deadline is for people who wish to get on a wait list in a capped zone okay. or for people who wish to apply for a new permit in a non-capped zone. Right. Anybody with an existing permit, and, 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 and this has been made abundantly clear in our department's communications yeah. to this point and will be going forward, right. anybody with an existing permit has until the end of the year to go into the Muni Rev system and go through the process of renewing that permit. And so those are different pipelines and right. different timelines. Yeah, right. I appreciate that very much. So, Philip, are you also saying that then um, after the end of the end of the year, in the first of the year, and you see how many existings have applied, you'll then find out if there are new available in any of the CAP districts that would go to the wait list in the order that they were received. That is correct. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. And that, that photo that you're using there, that's of people that successfully got their <laughs> permit I, application. I, I was thinking they were people maybe visiting and using a short-term oh, okay. rental. Happy, <laughs> happy short-term rental occupants. Yes. Well, I want to do that yeah. soon. You have, you have yeah. to get a short-term rental to be yeah. able to. I have <laughs> several. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's, you can go to the next page. It's, any other questions? <laughs> A great I actually I have w one question that I just wanted to start with. Um, sure. In the uh, summary and background that you've provided in the memo, mm -hmm. uh, it says here that um, last year there were 1,300, 19 mm -hmm. uh, valid vacation rental permits, 18% of all residential units in the city. Correct. All residential units, so that includes affordable housing units? There are two affordable. There are two permitted short-term rentals within the affordable housing zone district. I do not believe that they are affordable housing units. They're, but they're, they're definitely not in affordable yeah. housing units. To be super clear about that, they're up in the um, Williams Ranch. I, yeah, I understand. That wasn't the aim of my yeah. question. What I'm uh, alluding to here, and I think I think what you have here is correct. Um, there are about six thousand or something residential units. That includes affordable housing. Affordable housing units, in large part, are not available. So 18%, the percentage that this is of free market 
I think it was like 28%. Is larger. That's right. correct. My memory says. Yes. I just want to point that out for our community because, mm -hmm. um, you know, when we talk about other communities uh, that are also uh, dealing with uh, short-term rentals and the impacts that it's having on their communities, um, we truly in our community see a high percentage um, for properties that are truly, mm -hmm. you know, short-term rented. Um, and if you look at the number of our permits, the owner occupied are not a large portion of that. So again, what I'm kind of pointing out here for our community is we have a large percentage of our available residential housing that is not available for local residents and is not lived in. It is primarily used for short-term rental. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. If you could actually kind of formalize those numbers for me, I'd appreciate it. The, you know, the percentage of the pool when you take out the affordables, I, it just, I'd, I'd like to have accurate numbers. Mm -hmm. We can do it that. To the extent you can. Yes, we're happy to provide that information in a more detailed way for council. I, I think a, perhaps an info only memo would be a good vehicle for that information. And we will understand after the first of the year when we fully implement the new permitting system, the percentage of short-term rentals that are owner-occupied short-term rentals right. versus the classics. Right. We're going to learn uh, a lot. I, I realize it would be and, an estimate at this point yeah. in time, but it still would be very but valuable. As a percentage of free market residential units and which percentage is owner-occupied versus non-owner-occupied, how does that relate to the census uh, data statistic that was um, referenced earlier about overall free market vacancy rate? We can, we can provide a report around some of those, some of those um, housing, ha housing stock usage demographics. Yeah, that'd be super. Appreciate that. I just wanted to say thank you. It's been a long journey. It won't stop here, uh, but I think really fruitful for the community and starting to see all these constituent pieces come together into a, a digestible form is, is awesome. Thanks. Will you be doing any newspaper ads about the opening dates of permits being available or how to view the Q&A online or anything like that? I, I will admit that um, our staff has, has a fully baked communications plan uh, for the October 1st and December 31st deadlines. I am not fully briefed on the details of those plans, but okay. they've been vetted by the communications team and by um, their short-term rental program manager, Emmy Garrigus. Okay. And I feel really comfortable uh, to this point with our communications work, the level of engagement that we've had with our communications efforts, yeah. and feel really confident about that work going forward as well. Okay, that's great. I just wanted to make sure because I know just from what was on the screen, it was the uh, community dialogue uh, for an hour, and I, I wanted to make sure people who <laughs> may not be as uh, tech savvy or whatever would be able to see those notices and know when the deadline is. And yes, and, and we're disseminating that information through all the normal channels that the city has um, when we have a, a matter of such high sort of community interest. Okay. Thank you. John, any questions, comments, suggestions? I just want to say thank you as well. I read through the program guidelines and it seems very user friendly. I think anybody can figure out where they land just by reading through this quickly. So good work. Thanks. Thank you, John. Well, with that in mind, I want to take a moment to highlight Emmy Garrigus's work um, to this point. She, again, is the staff person who we brought on. Um, to, to manage the short-term rental program in addition to taking on um, the downtown services program. Um, and, that, and that was at the direction of the city manager's office to combine those two functions. Emmy has been doing a bang-up job since she started in June. Um, Haley has been instrumental in translating council's legislative desires into the creation of this program. And I, I just want to state for the viewing public that, that the Community Development Department takes very seriously the customer service role that we have and making sure that all of this rolls out smoothly. We recognize that we are in a position of supporting a very important industry in our community and we take that role very, very seriously. And we think that the work product to this point, our communications efforts, and the tools that we've made available to short-term renter owners and owners and operators uh, are, at least in our estimation, world-class. Um, and people can expect world-class customer service on the back end of that from our department as well. Mm. Very good. Thank you. One last question. Um, this is a great handbook, and 
I share everyone else's compliments on the work. It's really fabulous. Um, and you've probably already dealt with it. We're just not seeing it. But I'm wondering when someone actually gets their permit and will they be signing a form that says they agree to and understand what potential violations are or how to manage the unit? Have we come up with what, what it, it's a little bit of a contract in the sense that you get the permit for agreeing to certain things. Have, have we developed those forms yet? Yeah, so the, there's a one-page in-unit form that will have information such as, you know, noise, you know, compliance, trash, wildlife compliance um, for the specific issues that, such that's as, like... for in the unit for the potential tenants to read so they adhere to it. I'm wondering if when the owner of the, of, who's applying for mm -hmm. the permit, will they be signing yes. that they also yeah. agree to these terms? Got it. Yes. Dur yeah. For the application on Muni Revs for the permit, there will be sort of an attestment statement. Um, they will follow those mm -hmm. guidelines and understand. That is correct. Those. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I guess just the last thing, I mean, I just want to thank you guys as well. I know we've been through this for a long time, but this is like as close to sausage making as stuff gets. This was big. It was complicated. It took a long time. It took a lot of compromise and hard work, and I think we came up with something really great. I think it like really demonstrates that we work together well, and I just it's nice to be part of that. And it's nice to be part of this team. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for all your work on this. I <laughs> would make a motion to approve resolution number 99. I'll second. We have a motion and a second for resolution number 99. Is there any further discussion? Yet. We have a roll call vote, please. Yeah. Councillor Doyle? Yes. Councillor Mazzaro? Si. Councillor Richards? Yes. Mayor Tory? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you again. Thank Your you. Your hard work has paid off. Appreciate it. Yes, I will. Um, one second. I oh. it's something oh. during public comment. I'm so sorry oh. to tell you this, but um, make a motion. Just kidding. As our as a, just a random comment, but as our conference ended uh, at Mesa University, I picked up one of the student newsletters, which I'll share with everyone, that says. What is hold? What is the hold up with housing in Mesa County? <laughs> it is about the extreme conditions they're dealing with in Mesa County. For Read the first sentence, uh, a conversation about the housing crisis in Mesa County with city and campus officials. Uh, it's like the rest of the nation in the midst of a worsening housing crisis. But the interesting part was when the president of Mesa College told us that in the past, people would move to Grand Junction to work in the extractive industries or perhaps agriculture. But now they're moving here for the community, mm. for the weather, to be away from the big city, and to do um, remote work. And an awful lot of remote workers are taking up their housing, sure. and it's so much cheaper than the Bay Area or Chicago or New York. Sure. And we're seeing all sorts of jobs yeah. uh, become remote jobs. Yeah, and taxes so are lower. It, and its taxes are lower. So again, it's not just Aspen. When everyone thought of Grand Junction as an affordable place to retire to or to move to, and their average single family home price is over 400,000 now. Oh. So it's, uh, it's hit everywhere. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting. Now I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll second. Uh -huh. you. Motion a second. <laughs> for the Scooped you, bro. Can we have a roll call vote for adjournment this evening? Councillor Doyle? Yes. Councillor Mazzaro? Yes. Councillor Richards? Yes. Mayor Tory? Yes. 90 minutes on the dot for a regular meeting. That Thank you. Is, what's going on? What are you doing? You're doing something right. <laughs> yeah, they just a light agenda. Well, I'm just going to point out Ward's not here. <laughs> uh, let's blame Ward while he's out of the country. <laughs> I'm going to throw him right under the...